Whenever I write about a Republican politician or about the United States' own particular brand of social conservatism as exemplified by the Republican Party, my comment section and social media mentions become stuffed to bursting with Democrats. In and of itself, this is not a problem, not to mention completely expected. Donald Trump is so reviled among Democratic voters that anyone talking shit about him is their ally. And if the person bashing Trump has no immediate signifiers of their party or politics, Democrats will assume the person is one of their own. Democrats despise Trump so much that even when a Republican politician finds it in their best interest to criticize the former president, Democrats will make a mad dash to praise them, trampling over themselves like a mob at a Black Friday sale to shake that Republican's hand and extol their virtues, thanking them for their honorable service like they just returned from World War II. Despising Donald Trump is probably the morally correct position, and I share it. It's just worth noting that the way Democrats go about it has its own unique flavor. I wear my politics on my sleeve, or at least on my Twitter profile, yet people who are new to my work sometimes initially mistake me for a liberal Democrat because A. Some of my videos criticize individual politicians, usually in the Republican Party, and B. Democratic voters and Republican voters have been conditioned by their own parties to disregard anything resembling a political spectrum in favor of a binary a binary that does not contain the actual left wing. This happened as recently as my video from earlier this month, and I knew it would, so I included a line reminding any Republicans watching that their whataboutism on Obama, Biden, or either Clinton is even more meaningless if directed at me. If you have heard me say this sort of thing before in other videos, I apologize for this repetition, but it's necessary for my own sake. Social media has intensified this binary into sectarianism. Never before in human history have ordinary people had the opportunity to shout their opinions at more people at once. On paper, this is a good thing. It allows for political organizing, not to mention a diversity of political opinions touching the mainstream that might not have had that opportunity before. I certainly benefit from this, at least on some level. Unfortunately, the stewards of this political organizing are not the people themselves, but tech companies. You see, tech companies like Facebook and Twitter allow an enormous amount of misinformation and dangerous misuse of their platforms. They are not financially incentivized to stop doing this. They are not financially incentivized to ban people, to moderate misinformation, or to be responsible for their own platforms. They are incentivized to allow almost anything so long as it trends. Tech companies don't care about the vague concept of freedom of speech or the reductive concept of censorship either. They ban accounts when it is convenient to do so, and never a second before that. Social media engenders sectarianism because the moderators are asleep at the wheel, on purpose. Tech companies do not want to take responsibility. They want to take, you know, money. So a platform like Twitter helps raise the voices of people who otherwise might not be heard, but it also raises the voices of people who have no idea what they're talking about, who spread misinformation, and who profit from a binary us versus them politics as team sports model. Their followers are invariably people who cannot see beyond the corners of their voter registration cards. This explosive sectarianism creates insular communities. On Facebook, these communities form groups, both public and private, on Twitter, the communities feature has only recently been added, but when Twitter users refer to different communities on the platform, they are not referring to these recently branded user-moderated communities, they are referring to loosely organized affiliations. Communities that form more organically due to the platform's microblogging and retweeting apparatus. Hockey Twitter is not some members-only club. About hockey, it's just what people on the platform call the unofficial community on the platform surrounding this interest sewing Twitter, artist Twitter, etc. There are also unofficial demographic Twitter communities like Black Twitter, Irish Twitter, and Gen Z Twitter. These communities come complete with their own major figures and important accounts, unelected and unofficial, but nonetheless significant to that community. Behold, Democrat Twitter, the most obnoxious corner of the platform. Notice I did not say worst corner of the platform. Democrats love to tell you that Republicans are worse. And admittedly they are, congratulations. But that bar is not too difficult to clear and leaping over it is not an accomplishment. The party line of Democrats are still better than the Republicans does not foster enthusiasm, but defeatism. An ennui of hardworking beleaguered people who have been convinced that this is about as good as it gets. I will give this to the average Democrat though. You can talk to a liberal Democrat, 
A conservative Republican's more rigid hierarchical social politics always makes their friendship or camaraderie feel conditional on assimilating into that hierarchy. There is only so much I can say to Republicans to stop them from behaving like the Simpsons parody of themselves, but maybe Democrats will be a little more willing to take criticism and listen to someone giving them advice, even if that someone is well to the left of their party platform. So here goes, let's talk about Democrat Twitter. This should be fun. Remember those major figures and de facto leaders of a Twitter community? Unfortunately for Democrat Twitter, their leaders are chosen by Democrats, and we all know how that goes. Um, now you might be thinking that the leaders of Democrat Twitter are prominent Democratic politicians, but not really. <laughs> Democratic politicians don't have spicy enough takes to trend on the platform due to something they said exclusively on the platform. They usually trend for the normal, newsworthy reasons. Pete Buttigieg is important enough to have a Twitter account with a lot of followers, but not interesting enough to be Twitter famous. Well, who is? I already knew quite a bit about Democrat Twitter before I started doing my research, but I did ask Twitter for their opinions as well, and the results were fascinating. I've made hundreds of videos over the past 12 years, and this is the first one in which those who I'm criticizing are basically ordinary people and not politicians. A disclaimer, please don't bother these people on Twitter.com. This is not some call out video. It's just research and talking about stuff. Muller, she wrote, is the official Twitter account of the podcast of the same name. The podcast is hosted by Allison Gill, who at the time of its inception was employed by the United States Department of Veteran Affairs. She used the pseudonym AG and when discovered was terminated. Democrat Twitter loved Robert Mueller, the man tasked with investigating Donald Trump's alleged connections to the Russian government. If there's one thing Democrats hate, it's Republicans. And if there's one thing Democrats love, it's a Republican. Democrat Twitter was absolutely in love with this powerless civil servant for years, genuinely expecting that the sitting president of the United States would be handcuffed in the Oval Office and dragged out through the front gates. All the late night lib shows talked about it in the same way, sometimes in song. It's you. That was never going to happen. The idea that Trump would land himself in legal trouble before he was out of office places a completely unearned amount of faith in institutions designed to protect the powerful, not protect the people. But that's just how liberals think of the nation. Liberals think that it's a shining beacon of democracy, a polity that exists voluntarily instead of what it actually is, a territory with a monopoly of violence controlled by the biggest gang. Mueller, she wrote, has since pivoted to unrelated crimes allegedly committed by Trump and garden variety Democrat cold takes. Allison seems like a perfectly nice person, but I would be remiss in my duties, I guess, in this if I did not mention one thing. She recently told people disappointed by Biden's limited debt forgiveness that they are partially responsible for mass shootings if they don't vote Democrat. But otherwise, yes, very nice, I'm sure. We all have bad days and bad takes. This one is just a lot. And tells us what we need to know about the limited political spectrum and binary absolutism in the minds of many Democrats on social media. The insulting, mindless notion that not being a registered Democrat and not voting Democrat is selling out. To sell out is to violate your principles for selfish concerns. But this take about selling out by not voting Democrat rests on the shaky foundation that not being a Democrat or not voting for a Democrat is an inherent violation of principles. Even other registered Democrats are not violating their principles by demanding more for their vote. That's part of the democracy that liberals believe they have in the first place. It presumes too much about the individual principles of others and minimizes economic concerns that are also life or death. More people die every year from preventable conditions due to poverty and lack of affordability than will ever die from horrific mass shootings. And the removal of $50,000 of debt would go a long way toward resolving that problem. Even if she did not mean it like, take your crumbs, losers, or whatever, it still comes across extremely insensitive, especially from someone who had so much of her debt forgiven. By the way, trying to guilt someone into voting does not work. So this does not even make sense as a pragmatic thing to say, let alone an ethical thing to say. Nobody has an obligation to vote for your candidate. 
Maybe your candidate sucks. Maybe some people are trying to build a new world instead of endlessly trying to repair the current world. Maybe some people focus more of their attention on that. I'm sure I've said insensitive things as well, but this is still garbage. Okay, who's next? Majid Padelan boasts an impressive Twitter account with over 1 million followers. He calls himself Brooklyn Dad. Brooklyn Dad spent his time advocating for Joe Biden, demanding that Bernie Sanders drop out, and casting doubt on the women that Andrew Cuomo sexually harassed and groped. However, Brooklyn Dad is mostly known for his affiliation with a political action committee. For the uninitiated, a political action committee, or PAC, is a tax-exempt organization that campaigns in favor of a political candidate or political cause. After it receives its donations, the PAC then transfers a limited amount of those funds to its stated candidate or cause, and then uses the rest to advertise its candidate or cause. PACs have a history of being helpful to unions, but PACs in the 21st century largely exist to shuffle money around and get around campaign finance regulations. PACs are only superficially independent, and any declaration of PACs having only non-connected affiliation with a candidate is naive. Ever since the Supreme Court decision of Citizens United v. FEC, many of the regulations that kept PACs in some semblance of order have been rescinded. Conservative justices decided that money is free speech, a statement that would not be out of place in dystopian social fiction. So who is Brooklyn Dad in all this? In 2021, it was discovered that a political action committee paid him over $57,000 in the 2020 election cycle and over $12,000 in the current election cycle. In total, nearly $70,000 that we know of. The political action committee paying him is called Really American PAC, which sounds like something a Martian would call its covert organization on Earth, but all PACs have names like that. Really American PAC saw Brooklyn Dad's defenses of multiple criminal sex allegations and said, what an opportunity, and started paying him tens of thousands of dollars to ramp it up on behalf of Biden. This is because Brooklyn Dad had an air of authenticity and writes his tweets with a certain flavor that might make Joe Biden seem cooler than he actually is. Brooklyn Dad has pushed back, claiming that he disclosed these payments by declaring himself a senior advisor to Really American PAC in his Twitter profile eventually. From his perspective, he has been upfront about these payments. However, there are two problems here. First, he changed his Twitter profile to reflect his affiliation with this PAC sometime after he started getting paid. Open Secrets shows his payments began on July 13th, 2020. The Wayback Machine on the Internet Archive shows that the next day, July 14th, he had made no such disclosure. The earliest record of his affiliation can be found around the end of the month. Second, this disclosure did not really disclose anything in the first place. Senior advisor is a meaningless title and says nothing of the reality of the relationship or compensation. He's not advising anything, he's tweeting. He's being paid to tweet pro-Biden propaganda and defend Biden from accusations in a way that appears organic and not prompted by money. But it's not organic and it is prompted by money. He did not disclose anything meaningful by changing a word in his Twitter profile. His compensation was not discovered until 2021, and he was not the one who brought it to the public's attention. An advertisement for a political action committee must disclose its origins. Here's an example. Winning our future is responsible for the content of this message. However, a PAC can get around this by paying social media influencers and giving them meaningless titles. That way, they are simply employed by the PAC, and their tweets are not legally official advertisements, even though, you know, these tweets are functionally exactly that. Third, even if we all concede that everything is above board, and that the FEC and Open Secrets both have it wrong, and that Brooklyn Dad actually did not get paid until after his Twitter profile half-disclosure, and that his senior advisor title is more meaningful than we know, that does not really change the fact that his commentary cannot possibly be taken seriously. He is paid by a political action committee that exists almost exclusively to promote a politician. If you support Joe Biden, then cool, go for it, I guess. But that is not entirely what's happening here. 
Every tweet is a paid advertisement for the President of the United States that does not need to disclose that it is a paid advertisement for the President of the United States and is written and posted in such a way that it does not necessarily look like a paid advertisement for the President of the United States. And his tweets don't end with, This tweet sponsored by Really American Pack. I read a lot of articles about this matter, and the only one that defends Brooklyn Dad does so with erroneous information, and I would like to clarify that now. Brooklyn Dad was sent money on July 13th, but this article says the FEC reported it in September. Case closed, right? Wrong. FEC expenditure data is not the same as its contributions data, and they are reported at different times. Open Secrets reports when the payment was sent to the recipient. The FEC filing that the article is citing is when the recipient, in this case Brooklyn Dad, reported it to the FEC. Often the recipient of a payment does not report this payment until the following period. Brooklyn Dad reporting his payment in September does not mean that he received it in September. He received it in July and apparently reported it months later. This is not unusual. I'm not making any wild guesses here, this is just literally how it works in clear, unambiguous language from both the FEC and Open Secrets. So no, Daily Dot article, you appear to be wrong, and your debunking has been debunked. We all make mistakes. Again, the date of his payment does not change much of the moral calculus of this, at least for me, but it's a point of contention that needed to be clarified nonetheless. What about other Democrat Twitter leaders? Well, there's Occupy Democrats, a fake news media service. Occupy Democrats is among the most unreliable sources of news on the internet, consistently spreading misinformation and hyperbole, frequently fact-checked and frequently found to be lying, or at least spreading half-truths. Occupy Democrats also has the worst Twitter practice of ending almost every tweet with retweet if you agree. So it's like, do you think Joe Biden was right to say that kittens are good? We do. RT if you agree. RT if you agree. RT if you agree. It's embarrassing to watch, but Democrats eat that stuff up. If you're a Democrat, you need to stop following Occupy Democrats right now. They're fake news, okay? It's not just Republicans who engage in that sort of thing. You're being fooled and you need to stop. What they say is mostly not true. The average Twitter Democrat does not have a big following, but they are just as easy to spot as the unelected leaders. They can be spotted by their emojis alone. A big emoji for Democrats on Twitter is the globe, signifying globalism, particularly the economic variety. It's also a reclaiming the word movement for Democrats because the right tends to use the word globalism to wink wink nudge nudge at right wing anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. You are more likely to find blue hearts, blue waves, and other assorted bits of blueness. The Democratic Party and Democrat Twitter specifically have pushed the vote blue no matter who talking point and hashtag to consolidate power around the establishment of the party. It's not a talking point meant to create a big tent in which social democrats are part of the no matter who. You see, behind the scenes, the DNC can sabotage most candidates to their left, rallying their forces and money around their establishment candidate sometimes scumming the opposition in the primaries. Then, in a more public way, the DNC will say, vote blue no matter who, because they chose who in the primaries. They are telling Democrats with roses in their Twitter profiles who favored the now defeated and sabotaged left-leaning candidate to vote for the establishment candidate in the general. They are not telling Democrats with bagels in their profiles to vote for Social Democrats because they are actively sabotaging Social Democrats behind the scenes. Democrat Twitter loves going after Donald Trump, but remember that unique flavor I was talking about? Well, Democrat Twitter loves anti-Trump memes, but the worst kind. A lot of bad jokes and political cartoons. Nobody is swayed by calling Trump Cheeto Mussolini or other boring references to Trump's skincare regimen or hairdo. Nobody cares. This is not meaningful. It's a bunch of boomer Facebook memes populating other social media platforms. You're not going to convince anyone to drop Trump with a haircut joke, and you're just feeding Republicans who think that opposition to Trump is superficial, or Trump derangement syndrome, instead of what it actually is opposition to his right-wing politics, his right-wing rhetoric, and his alleged crimes. All this, haha, Trump has small hands, stuff, 
did nothing and continues to do nothing. Democrat Twitter thinks it has a winner with Dark Brandon, a meme about President Joe Biden awaking from his ancient slumber suddenly and without any provocation, finally addressing some of his campaign promises, but like he's just doing some basic governing because we are only a couple months away from the midterms. It's not mysterious or scary or anything, it's just the election cycle with a meme that makes Democrats look like they suddenly love Fashwave. So I don't know, proceed at your own risk on this one. It's the kind of meme that can and will be weaponized by 4chan psyops. I would knock that off before it becomes something that neither the Democratic Party nor Democrat Twitter can control. <sighs> so, final thoughts. Democrat Twitter is terrible. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, no, look, I, I guess when you try to build an online community full of messages with imposed character limits, political parties find this extremely useful because those character limits shake out to roughly the same size as a sound bite or talking point that they want to get out there. Every tweet feels like an ad for the party and not just from the grifters. Every bit of internal opposition, or just, you know, reasonable pushback, is attacked by the K-Hive or something because it too closely resembles criticism from the Republican Party. The loudest voices will always be promoted. Twitter is literally designed that way through its trending topics. There is little room for nuance on Twitter, and even less room in party politics. It's the perfect, unhappy marriage. Hi everybody, if you like what I do, make sure to subscribe to my channel and click the notification bell so that you never miss an episode. Also check out my Patreon link. See you soon.